Welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast, another full length edition. I'm with my co host and co conspirator, Jimmy the Dr. Bucciolato. Hey, hey now. everyone. We got Ben behind the glass, and today we're going to do a deep dive of the New York Purple Gang from the 1970s, and uh, we're going to bring that story up into modern times by talking about the 10-year anniversary of the Michael Meldish murder. Um, Meldish was one of the leaders of the Purple Gang back in the 70s, and then in the 2010s, um started to butt heads with a number of the guys that he was with in the purple gang that he was a shot caller over. Uh, but fast forward 30, 40 years, those Italians had ascended past him and now he was taking orders from them. Didn't turn out so well. Uh, he ended up dead in 2013, but let's bring on our guest, Scott Dietschy. Uh, one of uh, you know, we're huge fans of Scott uh, on this show, and uh, Scott just uh, published a book in the last year called Hitmen, um, drugs, murder, uh, and and the uh, East Bronx Harlem Purple Gang. Scott, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on. Um, so you know, let's let's just just dive right in. What what uh. What first drew you to the to the subject matter, and you know maybe tell us you know how you got started in in your research. Sure. So when I was writing my book before this, Garden State Gangland, um, I was researching the murder of Johnny Coca Cola Lardier, who was a Genovese mobster who was um, shot and killed in the late seventies. He was on uh, like a furlough from prison. And he was shot and killed. Um, and police traced this ballistics on his gun to a number of other murders that had happened around the similar time period. Not all were Jersey based, so I didn't really focus on them. But it led me to an article from New York Magazine where they talked about these 22 caliber killings that were going on in New York and New Jersey at the time. And they brought up the name of the Purple Gang. And this was around 2014. So it was already after the Meldish hit. So I kind of had heard the East Harlem Purple Gang and little bits and pieces over the years, but never really piqued my interest. But after reading this article and started doing some digging, I'm like, oh, there might be a story here. That coupled with the Meldish murder um, really started uh, piquing my interest on it. So I started doing some research and, uh, you know, you know, put together the book proposal, hoping that someone was interested. And sure enough, um, the publishers who did Garden State Gangland were very interested in it. So that that kind of kicked it off. And um, I wrote it primarily during COVID, which was interesting because it, some ways it kind of focused my writing, but in other ways it kind of limited some of my traditional avenues of research. So, um, but I was able to get some some really good stuff. And uh, yeah. So that, that's how that came out. If you had to give people that don't know anything about the New York Purple Gang and you had uh -huh. to sum it up in you know 30 seconds, how would you tell people who these guys were? Yeah, so the, Purple, the New York Purple Gang were a group of young mob associates. Some of them are related to made guys who kind of all grew up in East Harlem and kind of fanned out East Harlem in the Bronx. And by the early 70s, were heavily involved in narcotics, heroin, uh, cocaine to some extent, and uh, pretty much had this kind of path of violence and drug dealing through the through the 1970s, and then kind of fizzled out by the early 80s. A lot of them became made members. A lot of them were dead, <laughs> and then some of the guys just were still hangers on. But uh, yeah, so it was a group of these really violent, drug connected young wise guys it was like a farm team for the five families and and you know to throw out a name that we've talked a lot about in the last year or two here on the og pod mikey knows mancuso who's the boss of the bonanno crime family right now was one of the original new york purple gangers yeah. and his ascension uh to the boss's chair played a role in his old friend michael meldish's murder not the central reason why he got hit, but it definitely played a role and foreshadowed uh, 
you know, an incident, the incidences that the instance of acrimony between Meldish and Mancuso happened around uh, 2011, 2012. Um, and Meldish was killed in 13. So it, it kind of set the foundation or, 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 or laid the roots about these guys who had once been subservient to him that now he was forced to take orders from. Uh, and with Mancuso, it came down to a, a woman that Mancuso didn't yeah. like that Meldish was running around with when Mancuso was locked up. Yeah. So Mancuso goes away in like what? 2008. Six, I think it's um, six. six. six got, he, somewhere it's there. arrested in six. Yeah. And in August of 2011, uh, Michael Meldish is hanging outside Rayo's, the, the famous restaurant in East Harlem. It's during one of the festivals. And he gets approached by three Bonanno guys, uh, Enzo Stagno being one of them. They basically beat the shit out of him there, right in the street, as kind of a warning from Mancuso is, you know, stay away from this woman that yep. was at the center of this kind of weird love triangle there. Uh, so, yeah. That, and then, of course, that turns into. Meldish trying to kill Stagno and he kind of the, the linchpin person in that is a gentleman named Terrence Caldwell, who was the, the gunman both in the attempted murder of Enzo Stagno. And if you're to believe what, what the courts found the, the gunman in the Michael Meldish murder. So, so he's on both sides of that. Yeah. Well, he was a guy that was doing heavy work for the Lucchese's Meldish before he fell out of favor with both the Lucchese administration and the Bonanno administration had been working with uh, Terry Caldwell, right? Yeah. Right. And it, it was funny. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the exact quote, but basically he says, Oh, I met, I met Terry. I was walking down the street one day and I liked his jacket, like some bullshit excuse. Like he didn't know this guy before. But like you said, there were there were definitely connections with Caldwell and, and some of these guys. And I, we should also know and we'll get back to this in a second or mm -hmm. down the down the line in this interview when we come back to this. But Mancuso was caught on a prison wire the day or two after Meldish took his beat down mm -hmm. and he's like laughing about it and recalling it and talking about how he learned his lesson and how he was spitting up blood. and. Yeah. So, I mean, it. so let's let's go back to the um, to the 70s and, and talk about mm -hmm. the Meldish brothers, Joe and Mike Meldish. They're not Italian, no. but they kind of rise to become there wasn't really a boss of the Purple Gang, but they were like the de facto bosses. So, yeah. So basically what happens, I'll give you like the, the quick and dirty. Uh, there's the big mafia bust in 72. Um, Carmine Tremonti, guys like Herbie Spelling, uh, the government like really clamps down on the heroin trafficking coming out of East Harlem. There's a couple great books, of course, those of your viewers and listeners that know about mob collectibles, there's a book called The Pleasant Avenue Connection. It's incredibly hard to find book, goes for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, if you can find a copy. But it, it basically details some of this early effort by uh, NYPD to crack down on mob heroin trafficking. So when all these big guys get arrested in the early 70s, there's this little bit of a power vacuum and then steps in these purple gang guys. So the Meldish brothers, they grow up right outside, east, right in East Harlem, right near Pleasant Avenue. You have the Priscos who are related to the Meldishes. Um, Angelo Prisco, of course, who later goes on to become a member of the Genovese family. Very powerful couple. Very powerful capo. And, you know, so there's this really tight familial connections and neighborhood connections. And, yeah, the, so the Meldishes are, uh, by the mid-70s, if you read, like, DEA reports and stuff, they're the hitman. They're the, the muscle. They're the strong arm guys. So Michael and Joe, you know, Daniel Pagano up in Rockland County are, are calling the Meldish brothers up to come shake down carting contractors because he wants to control garbage. So. Yeah, to your point, they quickly rise in rank in this gang. What's their lineage? They're not Jewish. I thought they were Jewish. No, oh, I'd have to look that. I'll probably remember after we get off here. <laughs> but they're they're not. So, but just to be clear, they're not Italian. They're, they're not, not Jewish. Italian. No, they're not Italian. Uh, so you know, these were guys that were, um, you know, kind of. I don't want to say mutts, but you know, they weren't guys yeah. that had any chance of ever getting made. 
Correct. But they were, but they were in some ways the equivalent of made guys in terms of the respect that they were afforded by, at least until the end with Michael, uh, the respect that they were afforded by the five families. Absolutely. And, and they had a really violent reputation. So one of the things I talk about in the book is there's a wide range of numbers when describing how many people Michael and Joseph Meldish killed anywhere from 10 to 100. <laughs> so somewhere in there is probably the exact amount of people that they've killed or their murders attributed to them. Um, so they definitely had this kind of wild reputation. And is, it true Jimmy that, is it true that the inspiration for this group is the Detroit, the, the infamous Detroit Purple Gang? So one of the things I tried to do is find exactly where the name, the Purple Gang, came from in relation to this group. If you read law enforcement reports, they said it was the press that came up with the name. If you read the press reports, they say law enforcement came up with the name. I talked to a couple people that grew up on the streets, one of which was a, was a heroin supplier where I worked with Nicky Barnes. And he said he thinks they saw the movie The Purple Gang and then just kind of based on the Detroit Purple, Purple Gang and kind of took that on themselves. So the origins of the moniker are murky, uh, kind of like the Westies in a way. But um, by the 70s, they're referring to themselves as the Purple Gang. And that kind of moves out into the greater Obdom. You know, you, Scott, you, both of you guys probably know, you talk to mob guys nowadays, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, he was in the Purple Gang, or he was a purple guy. So that, that name has stuck 50, 50 years going on now. And in Detroit, it was, you know, the Purple Gang, uh, the most iconic, ruthless, powerful uh, prohibition uh, uh, criminal organization in Detroit history. They only existed for about 10 years from about 20, 25 to 35. But you had a lot of those remnants, guys that had been around that group that lasted into the 2000s. And I just want to piggyback off your point about in New York, how the Mancusos and the Priscos, mm-hmm. uh, the Meldishes, uh, when their names come up, you say, oh, they're an old time purple ganger. Well, in Detroit, up until, let's say, 20 years ago, most of the Jewish racketeers that were operating in Detroit after Prohibition up into the new millennium were guys that had affiliations to the purple gang and they mm-hmm. were referred to by the Italians. Oh, those guys are old purples. Yeah. And yeah, there are a lot of parallels. And I didn't even realize you mentioned the 10 years of the Detroit Purple Gang because that East Harlem Purple Gang was basically about a 10 year yeah. run. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of similarities and a lot of bodies. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that was the, that's kind of the one. Um, I mean, there's I oh. guess there's a lot of commonalities, but the most, uh, you know, out pushed in your face bridge between these two is is bloodlust so one thing i'll I'll ask you then um so one of the features of the east harlem purple gang in regards to violence is when it starts in the like 71 it starts a lot of it's internal there's little frictions internally so you see guys like within the gang or hangers on getting killed and then as they kind of coalesce and strengthen it kind of goes out and they become like guns for hire and and Violence. It was it similar with the same thing in Detroit. I do when I do my talks. Uh, a lot of Jewish organizations will have me, and they want me to come and give the Purple Gang were the Robin Hoods of Prohibition, and <laughs> they were there to protect all the Jewish neighborhoods. And I I quickly take a sledgehammer to that narrative or that notion. I'm like mm-hmm. these, and these are for anyone that doesn't know. I mean, these were my. Uh, that, that's my blood. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the Purple Gang in Detroit were started and founded and led by the four Bernstein brothers. They were my great grandfather's first cousins. They all came over from Russia together. And um, my grandpa and my uncle spent a lot of time around those guys uh, uh, in their youth and mm-hmm. actually helped uh, Ray Bernstein, who was the one that went to prison for 35 years. When he came out in the late 60s, my grandpa, and my uncle took care of him. Uh, for the last couple of years of his life, he had no family. Oh, wow. uh, but the, I always say that the, the Purple Gang in Detroit were Jewish gangsters that preyed on themselves or other 
Jewish businessmen. They weren't at war with the Italians. Mm -hmm. They weren't at war with the with the Irish. They were they weren't killing the Irish. They weren't killing the Italians. They were killing and extorting other Jews um, out of the, you know, anywhere between 500 to 1000 murders that have been attributed to them. Mm -hmm. You know, 90 percent of them were either with in the Purple Gang or other Jewish racketeers in Mm -hmm. that orbit. So, yes, there's there's another, uh, you know, a pretty stark um, it's commonality. Did, I, yeah. I don't want to get too sidetracked here. I apologize to the audience. No. Scott, did your dad ever meet Ray? Yeah, he doesn't have a my dad. Again, that's, I don't want. I don't want, want to talk about an OG. Like if he I don't want, Ray, that's pretty gnarly. He my my dad met a lot of people back when he was a kid. Uh, not to go down this rabbit hole, but my dad had a lot of trauma uh, in his life as a child, so he doesn't. He blocked a lot of it out, uh, but Meyer Lansky was at his uh, bar mitzvah. Wow. Um, my uncle Al married Meyer's goddaughter, so uh, whenever Meyer Lansky would come to Detroit, he'd stay with my family. I have FBI documents from the '60s where the FBI g- got him at the airport and followed them to my grandparents' house. Wow. Uh, well, in like ni- in like 1962. Not to continue this off track thing, but uh, I don't know if you heard Scott, but uh, Meyer's daughter Sandy passed away the other day here in oh. Tampa. Oh, well, uh, yeah, she wrote the book "Daughter of the King." Yeah, which, uh, yeah. yeah. So, but uh, I, I, you know, I'll, let's seg- segue back. But I'll I'll say what, what I heard from a couple of my New York sources when I asked them about this, and they echoed uh, what Scott had heard that these were guys that. Uh, As little kids or not, maybe not little kids, but as, you know, in elementary, junior high school, um, they had seen the movie, The Purple Gang with Robert Blake. And then in the TV show, The Untouchables, which was a very popular show with Mm -hmm. Robert, Robert Stack, the Purple Gang, while they were not uh, every episode characters, they were recurring characters. kind of bad guys or villains uh, yeah. in in the untouchables over i think a four or five year run of the untouchables um so from the movie and the television show the untouchables i was told that uh these new yorkers when they became uh you know into their into their 20s and, and were becoming gangsters that they latched on to that name from their youth yeah, and in fact, I'm, I just pulled up a couple of the names on there, and, and that's another thing to keep in mind too with the with the Purple Gang is they were all kind of the same age cohort, so they right. were all in their early twenties. So there, there's there's that connection too. There wasn't a lot of generational spread among them. How many guys would you say got their button in in one of the five families from that group? Was it more than ten? Maybe about ten. I'm look well, obviously Mancuso, uh, Danny Leo. Um, uh, and, and, and let, let's be clear again for people that might not know a lot of these guys didn't just become buttons no these guys were major players in some of the five families over the mm-hmm. years Pris- yep. we said prisco very powerful capo mancuso and danny leo became bosses you know godfathers mm-hmm. and yep. danny leo um with with the the genovese right Danny yep. the Lion and the uh, and uh, Mikey with with the bananas. So the, these and, uh, were and the, uh, Maddie Madonna. I was just going to say Maddie Madonna, another big one. Right, so was Maddie Madonna in the purples or he was supplying the purples? He was around the he purples. Was, he was. Yeah, because if you look at when when he during the trial, during the Meldish trial, he's referred to as a purple gang guy and he's in that mix. He's not exactly like. We, so it, there's no like hierarchy, so it's kind of hard to tell, but there were a group of purple guys that dealt the drugs and there were some that were suppliers. So uh, like Thomas D'Ambrosia, who was affiliated with the Columbos and um, uh, Maddie Madonna. So Maddie Madonna, of course, was selling heroin to Nikki to Barnes. Nikki Barnes yeah. Supplier, so. and, and Maddie had a brother, Frank who although did not achieve the later success that Maddie did, but from what I can understand back in the seventies, Frank Madonna was just as big, if not bigger than Maddie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So what, what 
other than the fact that they just got into their 30s and started to um, kind of climb the ladder past the, the farm team and get drafted into the big leagues, if you will. Mm-hmm. What were the other what were the other things that uh, brought the era of the New York Purple Gang to an end? Uh, law enforcement. Uh, there were some cases in the late seventies, like Frank Vicerdo Jr. He, he had a couple cases: one for running guns, another one for drug trafficking. A few other guys got picked up. You know, Matty Madonna, of course, goes away in the mid seventies for a long time. Uh, so you start seeing some law enforcement split. The other thing is a lot of these guys start moving up to uh, like Tuckahoe, Yonkers, the Bronx. So they start kind of spreading out a little bit more. Um, and then get affiliated with other groups. So you see in the early 80s, some of them, even the ones that weren't made, they start, you'll see like one of their names associated with a totally different group of of wise guys. So I think it just, you know, as they grew and they started geographically moving, some of them went to Florida, um, you started seeing that splinter a little bit. So it wasn't so much like these guys hanging out in East Harlem doing this. It did, did the... I, I excuse my naivete or my lack of uh, understanding the way that the Harlem and Bronx area has evolved over the last 50 years. But it, is that area right now? I'm guessing it's different than it was uh, in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, East Harlem, for, for those of your listeners who don't know, when you, you know, when you think of Italian neighborhoods in New York City, you think Little Italy. But the largest Little Italy was in East Harlem. Um, but, you know, that starts disappearing by the 70s. Uh, obviously, New York in the 70s is a very gritty uh, kind of rundown place. Um, so, yeah, some of those areas have gentrified. Some of them still aren't great. But, but yeah, it's, it's definitely changed quite a bit since the era of the, the Purple Gang. Um, and that, but, that you was- know, it, it was kind of that natural move. You move out of the inner city neighborhood out to the Bronx or Yonkers where you have a backyard, more suburban areas. In terms of the Genovese though, that East Harlem crew, 115th street, Mm -hmm. uh, that crew is still very powerful. Yeah. 116th street. Is 116th? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 115, 116. So to your point, the families that really you see the purple gang kind of going into Lucchese's, um, Bananos, Genovese, a few into the Colombos, very little Gambino uh, connection to the Purple Gang. So really the Genovese are, are kind of the big ones that the Purple Gang kind of uh, move move into. I don't remember when John Ormento died. Big John Ormento is, I think, one of the most interesting Lucchese guys. And he, he was he was getting supplied. He was a big heroin trafficker. Mm-hmm. But he, was, he was being supplied by Detroit for a long time because he had. He was a, very close to Jimmy. To the, right. To the very close teachers. to Jimmy Quasarano. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and Ormento had trucking interest in Harlem, and so he, that's how he knew Melee, you know, Vince Melee and those guys. And then Melee introduced Ormento to Jimmy Q and the the Sicilian guys. But anyhow, I can't remember when Ormento died. I have his FBI files, and I, I can't remember. Was there any connectivity between, or was he already off the scene by the time the the Purples were getting started? So he was that that batch that got put away as the purples were coming up, but there was some overlap. You see, like uh, like Johnny Echoes is another one that that has some overlap with them. Okay, um, what's it, what's his last name? Was it Campo Piano? Campo Bianco. Yeah. And for people that don't uh, people that don't know, uh, Johnny Echoes was the basis for the Jimmy Two Times character <laughs> in Goodfellas. Yeah, it's Campo Piano. I just uh, put yeah. it up on the I'm going to go get the yeah. papers. Get the papers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which interestingly, not to kind of jump around, but, you know, he goes to prison for a while after this heroin. He gets arrested again in the 90s. And this never even made the papers. I found this by going through Pacer uh, with Michael Meldish, uh, narcotics trafficking in the mid 90s. So, yeah, some of these guys just kept at it. So it, it, it should also be noted that, you know, again, playing off of what you just said, Guys like Mancuso and Madonna don't get made until the 90s mm-hmm. because they have to go serve prison sentences. Yep. So they're getting made kind of late in life, but they're guys that would have gotten their button sooner if they had not been in prison. But once they get their button, they start to, you know, uh, the, the forward momentum in their career 
is going faster than you would think for someone that had only been made for a few years. I mean, Maddie Madonna, after a year or so, becomes a cop and then becomes acting boss pretty quickly. Mancuso, yeah. I think Mancuso had to wait eight, uh, maybe 10 years before he became acting boss. Um, but, you know, these are guys that uh, got their button a little later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, maybe it served them well kind of being in prison through the 80s, through that first big purge of law enforcement. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, and I think part of like with Madonna's, you know, the cases between the 80s and like Operation Button Down in the 90s, it got hit pretty hard. So it's good for career advancement. <laughs> There's not a lot of guys ahead of you. <laughs> so let's bring us, um, uh, let's, let's start to talk a little bit about uh the demise of Mikey Meldish. Mm -hmm. um, a guy, again, was a was a big shot caller in the Purple Gang, very dangerous. Um, but up until the last couple of years of his life, he was very, very respected and well-liked by very powerful New York mob guys and was um, allowed to operate I don't want to say autonomously, but uh, wasn't I didn't think he it didn't have the oversight that a normal associate would have. Yeah, was was given more of a a leash, I guess. And then you had the situation with Mike Mancuso, who's behind bars, and is upset that Meldish isn't listening to uh, messages being sent to him to stay away from this certain woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there appears to be money that was either loaned to Meldish or money that Meldish was collecting that he refused to kick up to Maddie Madonna. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. So, so wh wh why didn't he want to kick that money up to Maddie? I, I never really saw the the reason why that was an issue with Madonna and Meldish, but their relationship started to deteriorate quickly. And, um, you know, Meldish kind of starts getting hotheaded in dealing with Madonna. And, and that is one of the reasons that leads to this event that happens in November of 2013. And he's cursing him. Like he's out on the streets, like telling people, fuck Maddie Madonna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so November 13th, 2013, uh, and, you know, just like you see in the movies and we've talked about here a number of times when the mob kills you, you know, most, most of the times they're not sending guys with masks and guns. Mm -hmm. um, or, if they do send, or if they do send guys with masks and guns, they're guys that you know. And in yep. this case, these were guys that uh, he knew. Um, that he lowered his guard. Yeah. And so, you know, he Meldish or uh, Lond uh, Londonio and in Caldwell. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it says, um, you know, he's getting out of the car. He has like one leg out and someone like walks up to him and, and pops him right there on the street. It's in the, um, the Pelham Bay section of the Bronx. Uh, kind of, well, now in, in mob circles, kind of a well-known photo of him kind of half hanging out of the car, probably probably the last like major mafia hit photo, you know, of the modern era, uh, similar kind of to, you know, Angelo Bruno or something. Um, and, but police, police doesn't take police long to start, you know, putting together some Alyssa suspects and, um, you know, the interesting thing you, you have to keep in mind here is there's there's a couple very valid scenarios and motives from widely different sources as, yeah. to, as to who's killing Meldish. So um, it, and the other thing to keep in mind during this time, and this comes up if you watch some other interviews with like Frankie Pasqua or some other people, is that Michael's brother, Joe, is in state prison in New York for he, murder. Right. He doesn't have the protection of his brother on the street. Correct. Yeah, he's not on the street. So um, that's another thing that a lot of people and people I've talked to since the book have come out said that was another reason why they felt it was safer to kill Michael, that if his brother was still around, his brother would have just 
gone nuts and gone after people regardless of who they were in the mafia. And didn't his brother, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have pulled it up before we did this interview, but did the, didn't the, what the brothers in prison for was pretty brazen, wasn't it? Didn't he kill someone? Yeah, he in walked a, into a bar. Yeah, he walked yeah. into a bar and, and shot someone. Yeah. yeah and, he, and he was involved again in, in drugs and similar stuff that Michael was involved with. Uh, can, I, can I ask you guys just about psychology here? Um, I mean, the whole point, I mean, one of the points of being a made guy is you're protected by the organization. So even if, however tough these two brothers were, they're going to take on a family. They're going to take on hundred hundred button men. Like, I mean, I I can understand that, but like, I, I just find it it find it interesting that that the one brother's going around saying "fuck Maddie Madonna" and the other brother, you know, people are like, "oh, you better keep an eye on this guy." Did anyone have a sense of scale here? I mean, were these guys really. Like, they were- they I were don't un- know that they- much about this case study. So I mean, these guys were mm-hmm. unhinged and they 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 scared a lot of the made guys that, that they were around. And I think I, 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 I don't know if I'm overemphasizing this. I'm sure I am. Uh, but I just want to just be very clear to people that Mike Meldish was not your average mob associate. I, I, I guess the, the, what I keep on thinking in my head, being a Detroiter. You know, Alan Hilf uh, at the end, you know, he was he was Jewish and he wasn't made. But at the end of Alan's life, he, there other than uh, two or three, four guys, he he had more juice than everybody else. And he and he didn't have a button. Um, and, and Alan wasn't a tough guy. So that's a that's a bad comparison. But well, also, he I mean, Alan's proximity to power. He right. He was Jackie's right. Jackie's hand. best friend. Jackie's best friend. So he's mm-hmm. with he's with the boss every day for 30, yeah. 40 years. Yeah, right. Whereas Meldish sounds like he at, at this point was sort of alienated from yeah. any of the big, big. Italian but I, I just want to make sure that people understand that this was not your normal mob yeah. associate. This was a guy that was held in very high esteem until he wasn't. Like a Jimmy Burke, maybe something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yes. That's probably a better. Yeah. That's probably a better analogy. But to your point, even if Job Meldish was out when this happened, even if the guy was inclined to go start taking retribution on his brother's killers, it's only a matter of time before he ended up dead. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. have to kill a lot of guys. Yeah, the two of them couldn't take on the whole Lucchese family. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. And it, it just to to take this even further into modern times, Matty Madonna, his underboss, uh, Stevie Crea, mm-hmm. they're never going to see the light of day. They're, uh, they've been convicted of this murder and they were sentenced to life in prison in, uh, I believe it was a 2018 trial, yeah. or 2017 trial. Uh, John Panisi, a uh, friend of the show, uh, John was the star witness at their case. And, uh, John was inducted uh, into the Lucchese's by Maddie Madonna. And I think even now, John is feuding with the the Crea family. I know that uh, Stevie Wonder's son and uh, I think his uh, his daughter in law have been. They haven't ceased their attacks on Panisi uh, since since the since the trial. But Madonna is going to do life in prison is going to die in prison because of killing his old purple gang friend ally. So one other interesting connection to the purple gang on this is when the feds finally kind of put Londino as the, the shooter or involved in the murder. They arrest him in 2014 with uh, with a guy Pasquale Mayorino, who's a Bonanno soldier. His father Salvatore was tied in with the Purple Gang. So, and, well, well let, let, let's go one step further. His father Salvatore, who they called Chubby, proposed Michael Mancuso yeah. for his yeah. button. Mike Mancuso got his button in the Bonanos uh, uh, with with the backing of of Salvatore. Um, mm-hmm. My my arena. Yeah. And that's why Patty right now, from what I hear, uh Patty Boy is one of uh Mancuso's, you know, main loyalists who's help mm-hmm. who's gonna help uh guide the family 
uh, with with Mancuso. Uh, I mean, he's not becoming the boss or anything, but uh, a lot of Mancuso's loyalists are going to uh, have to, uh, you know, keep the lights on and, and keep the, sh- the ship steady for the next year when Mancuso has to report to prison in September to go serve uh, about a year on a, a supervised release violation. Yeah. And and by the way, you mentioned John before John Panisi. It was it was a big help. He uh, before when I was doing the research for the book, I I spoke to him a few times about some just background information on some some guys, and he uh, he spent some time with some of the more lesser known tangential members of the the Purple Gang over the years. So. He's very knowledgeable. His analysis is is uh, yeah, you know, is excellent. Didn't Seth Ferrante do some time with some of these guys from that old crew? Yeah. Seth was all mm-hmm. Seth was all over the federal system, so yeah. he was interacting with a lot of uh, OGs uh, in, in the mob. Uh, I believe he was with Maddie for a period of time. Yeah, I think if you check, if audience want to check our, we have a couple of audio episodes with Seth. We've never done a video interview with him, but we have a couple of audio episodes where he, he talks about doing time with some of those old Lucchese guys. Do you know? I I don't know a lot about Chris Londonio. Uh, who was the maid guy, I guess, in charge of arranging the details of the Meldish hit. Uh, I know there were some other people that tried to take credit for it uh, with the government, not just on the street. Mm-hmm. Can you can you color that up a little bit? Do we do we know where Londonio comes from? And I didn't find too much before that on him in terms of like, you know, official reports or or anything younger um, younger guy right a guy in his very younger guy yeah, yeah. yeah so i think he's just kind of coming on the scene at this point um but you know he gets arrested they quickly find uh, phone calls they show these in the bronx that night uh terrence caldwell who's you know already in jail for shooting enzo stagno they question him because they show him talking to Londina. so they you know they start tightening this noose around around these guys pretty quickly after, uh, you know, once the investigation gets going. And when, um, Ca- and when Caldwell shoots Stagno, Mancuso behind bars starts losing his shit. Yeah. Yep. Because just so we know Stagno is a soldier in the Bananos and uh, Meldish is an associate of the Lucchese. Mm-hmm. So uh, Mikey Mancuso orders Meldish uh, beaten for staying for not staying away from the girl. It happens in front of Rayo's three guys uh, dispatched from Mikey Mancuso. Enzo Stagno is one of them. The other two, I don't want to get into it, but they're names that we've talked about on here. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Names of guys that have been involved in the last year with Mikey Mancuso dispatched beatings. Um, same guys. And that was another he wasn't just saying fuck you to Manny Madonna, the boss of the Lucchese's. He was saying fuck you to Mikey Mancuso, the acting boss at that uh, uh, at that time. I don't know if he was official. I think he became official in 13. So it was around the same time. Yeah. But he's the boss of the uh, of the Bananos. So he, so in this 2011 to 2013, you have Meldish for all intents and purposes, at war with two different bosses. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I, I just pulled up a note because you asked about Londino. And um, yeah, I had a little thing in there. And uh, I forget who the source, one of them I talked to, but described him as a lifetime loser. So he wasn't a real highly respected guy. I know he was bragging uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And after you know, the, the fact. The interesting thing about like you said, this thing with the Bonanos and the Lucases is there's a very real case to be made that it was a Bonanno driven hit, you know, outside the legal and what was found in the court of law. So, um, yeah, it's it's one of those cases that there there's a multitude of suspects and can potential. You, can you take us it. can you take us through that that uh, theory that it could have come from the Bonanos? Well, yeah, th- just that. I mean, once you get down to the guys that are the shooters, it kind of falls apart because they're the Casey based guys. But, you know, there there was some defense testimony kind of trying to paint that, hey, Michael Meldish was at war with the Bananos and they are a legitimate, uh, you know, source of why he was murdered. And it wasn't these two Lucchese guys. The Lucchese's had nothing to do with it. 
They had never um, nailed. They had never nailed Manny Madonna on a murder before. I don't think he'd ever been charged in a murder before. To- no, and and I don't think was Korea charged. I know he was in prison for a while. I don't recall if there was a murder charge on there before. I don't before, think so. but but with uh, Mancuso and some of the other Bonanno guys, that that isn't the case. Mancuso has two murders that he's been convicted of. It's really a miracle that Mikey Mancuso, at sixty eight years old is still alive and kicking on the outside. He's been convicted of two murders. One was a manslaughter uh, and one was a conspiracy, but uh, saw the light of day um, on two separate occasions after Mm -hmm. being convicted, convicted of murders. Uh, But Matty Madonna, although he was a boss, not to say that he hadn't have ordered murders, but he wasn't someone that was known as a mad hatter, as a guy that was just wanting to kill everybody. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Did you and get even it? when he was at the Purple Gang? I, I never saw him attributed to any of the violence. It was mostly the drug aspect. And I think that's one of the reasons they wanted Maddie Madonna to help stabilize that family in the 2000s and 2010s after you had, you know, the Vic Amuso gas mm-hmm. pipe era of the uh, late 80s into the 90s. You had little Del, uh, little uh, Al Diarco flip. Um, I know there was a handful of guys before uh, Maddie took the, took the job, but um, kind of like we talk about with Joe Legambi with Philadelphia coming in after uh, Joey and John Stampha and, and Nikki Scarfo, he kind of yeah. uh, brought a level of respect back. I think M- M- Maddie Madonna did the same thing for a while with, with the Lucchese's. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that, you know, and, you know, like you said, keeping in mind, he wasn't made till he was 60 years old. So right. <laughs> So what, um, you know, if you had to kind of sum up your feelings on the project itself, are you you happy with uh, how it turned out? And where do you put this? You know, for for people that might not know, Scott is very acclaimed and very prolific, uh, started off as the Florida mob guy and did an amazing job with uh, books on uh, Scarcity Mafia, Silent Don. People should read this book if you're. If you're listening to the audio and you don't have the visual, the Silent Dawn, the criminal underworld of uh, Santo Traficante is an outstanding book. I highly recommend it. Nobody, nobody knows Florida better than Scott. I mean, he is by far the number one expert on Florida organized crime uh, in the world. And just like myself, sometimes you can you can get a little um, maybe feel a little stagnated if you're just in one place reporting on one thing mm-hmm. and, and, and Scott has started to uh, stretch his legs uh, yeah. over the last five, 10 years and writing about other areas. I love garden state gangland. Um, it's another book I recommend. Thank you. And, and then, you know, I, I got, I grabbed uh hitmen um, right way. You know, I think I got an advanced copy of it and I devoured that thing. in like two days, I just, I spent like two straight days just reading and I loved it. Thank you. Yeah. I, so, you know, I wanted to write a New York book. I wanted to write kind of something that in the seventies, kind of the grittier era. Um, I don't know if I'll go back to New York right away. I, my next book is probably going to be Jersey based. And then I, I still want to do an updated version of cigar city mafia. Cause that's been, it'll be 20 years in, in January of 24. And I've learned so much more over the years. Uh, on, on Tampa. So yeah, I, I don't know if I'll hit New York again, but, uh, but I really wanted to do this because I thought it was a story that hadn't been told. It hadn't really been written about. Um, and yeah, th- there's probably like five or six books <laughs> you can do kind of tangential off of it. But uh, yeah, you know, it's funny, Scott, I was talking with, um, I, I mentioned to a few people, but the, the funny thing about mob writers like us is we're kind of like the mob in a way where people have their territories that they write about, but New York city is big enough that, you know, it can accommodate <laughs> more people. So you don't have to ask permission to write about, New yeah. York. but you know, like if I wanted to do someone in Detroit, I'd have to go get the blessing of the Don. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, so, I think just, just the, the lay of the land right now is evolving more than ever in terms of the reporting aspect mm-hmm. of the underworld. You have a lot of the OGs, the guys that 
uh, were the pioneers, the guys that are the deans, the Jerry Capace. And Jerry still does an amazing job. I'm not saying that he's yeah, that yeah. he's that he's fallen off or anything, but there's just not as many people and outlets reporting on this as there was. I don't I'm not someone who, who attributes uh, that to the fact that there isn't stuff out there to report. And so that's a lot of people's retort to that is, well, there's a, the reason there's not more coverage is because there isn't stuff. There is. But, you know, so a lot of the newsrooms right now in New York City are being run by guys in their 20s or guys in their 30s that don't know the lay of the land. So they don't know yeah. the assignments that they have to to, to or they should be um dispensing and then the tony de Stef- tony de stefano's of the world and mm-hmm. and uh larry mcshane's of the world who do an amazing job at, at their outlets they have you know less assignments to write on on the subject matter which gives yeah. more opportunity for people like us to kind of come in and uh we don't really have bosses per se i mean you have an editor i've had editors but mm-hmm. you can come in and, and kind of maybe you know take some of that territory or uh, take some ownership for, for writing in that area just because there's a void. Well, and that's the thing I look for. I look for what stories haven't been told. I, we don't need another Gotti book. My God, seriously. give it Or, a Whitey, or a Whitey Bulger or a Whitey book. Bulger or an Al Capone book. But, you know, like when I did Gordon State Gangland, that came out in 2015. There had never been an overarching history of the mob in New Jersey. I mean, and there's only maybe a dozen books about Jersey up to that point. I mean, that's like when you, you know people think of Jersey, the Sopranos, it's just such a rich thing. So the other thing, too, with Hitman and some of the stuff I look for is what what are stories that interest me, first of all, that I want to write about? But what hasn't been told? What stories haven't been written? Because there's a lot of mob books out there. And, and you're starting to see more that are covering different stuff. But, um, you know, up until that early batch of mob books, there's, there's a lot of repetitive subject matter. This is probably the last, I mean, I know there's some Jewish gangsters in here too, but this is probably the garden state gangland is probably the last Italian mafia book I've read because these days, to your point, most of what I read these days is about the cartels or Mm -hmm. all bikers, or um, I'm just interested in other crime groups. Um, and uh, that's probably the last um, Italian mafia book I read. And it, it's really good. I highly recommend it to people. I got to get my hands on. I haven't. Uh, well, if you want to consider Scott's an Italian book, uh, I, I read that this year. Um, and I want to get my hands on the new um, Bill D'Elia book by Matt Burbeck. Yeah. I'm going gonna, yeah. gonna to take a little look into that. But yeah, they're not. Uh, the, and it just seems like a lot of stuff that's coming out is is rehashing old stuff. And um, I'm just, I've, I've, I've had my share of Gambinos in the eighties or winter Hill gang in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Um, Let me ask yeah. you guys, going back to the, the, the murder um, you were saying, is it that they're, they're pinning it on the Lucchese, but it seems like the bananas could have been responsible. You guys well know that it's possible. It could be both. Right. Crime families sometimes have a mutual um, Mm -hmm. make a mutual decision to take someone out. And then it's just a matter of logistics. Who's going to do it. But it's possible that do you you guys think it's possible that both signed off, signed off on this. It, I mean, sure. It's possible, especially since, you know, Madonna and Mancusa are also both purple gang guys who knew Meldish. So it's not like it's a, no, it's a small sphere of, connections there it's not not huge so the the chances that i think it's a probably a pretty good chance that there was some kind of conversation or communication or or something uh, along those lines well uh, the fbi uh said in their uh, some of their filings or the 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 u.s attorney that mancuso was taking a lot of meetings uh but but by the time but between when he was named official boss in 13 and he walked out in into a halfway house in, in late 18, uh, he was constantly uh, getting people coming uh, to visit him and sending messages back to the street, mm-hmm. uh, either through his um, 
I, I know that uh, Frankie Boy Salerno was a guy that was doing it. He, he called like his his nephew. Uh, so Ernie he's I, a purple gang guy. Frankie so Salerno. I think that might be his dad. Oh, his dad. Okay, yeah. Because Frankie Boy, because yeah. Frankie Boy, I think is like my as closer to my age in his mid mid forties or mid to late forties. Okay, so yeah, this guy would have been he was twenty two and seventy three. So yeah, it was probably his father. Yeah. yeah. So um it's very plausible that there was communication between them. And uh, Mancuso was very, very offended um by by what was going on in the street with, with Mike Meldish and then the the situation within the Lucchese's mm-hmm. as as Scott said, the relationship between Madonna and and Melders had frayed quite a bit. So what else you got work? What else you got uh, in the hopper right now, Scott? Anything you want to uh, share in terms of uh, where people can find you or, or stuff yeah. you, you got coming coming out soon? Yeah. So uh, TampaMafia.com is a link to my personal website and our Tampa Mafia tours, which will be starting up again in September. If you're down in the Tampa area, we, we do uh, – walking tours of Ybor City, the historic uh, district of Tampa, and talk about the, the mob history. Um, so those, the tampamafia.com, the easiest way, you can find all my information on there. And then um, I'm in the process of writing a proposal for my next book. And I'll just throw out the subject matter. I want to do a book on Jerry Katina. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so. And well, then, I'd, uh, I'd really like to have you come back on and absolutely. talk about the um, Traficante we do uh-huh. a full we'll do a whole Florida episode. I want to do yeah, yeah because I think that's um a fascinating uh subject because um when you when you read Scott's book and I'm talking about Dietschy, not Bernstein <laughs> uh the 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 um Silent Dawn for for a small borgata I mean he is at the intersection of so many interesting things the global mm-hmm. narcotics trade uh Kennedy Hoffa, Kennedy, right? The Kennedy assassination, Cuba. the Hoffa disappearance, Castro, yeah, right. Castro, uh, the the stuff that was a fifty seven Appalachian meeting, uh, stuff with Mar- with Marcelo in mm-hmm. uh, New Orleans, and he was connected to the New York guys, and it's just a really Donnie uh, Donnie, Donnie Brasco, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, Donnie Brasco, right, for, right. It's just a for a smaller borgata, it's just a fascinating story. It intersects with so many other interesting aspects of mafia history. And just crime history. Yeah, thanks. And like I said, that that's something that I'm going to also maybe work on on the side is updating uh, Cigar City Mafia, which is so much new material. But yeah, it's it's a fascinating topic for sure. Scott, I don't know why I've just this just popped in my head, uh, but I'm <laughs> just a, a, another a rabbit hole uh, jump in here for a second mm-hmm, before sure. before we before we leave. Yeah. Did you ever see the movie with Ben uh, that Ben Affleck directed about uh, the mob in Tampa? I think it's yes. called Live by Night. Yep. So, well, I, I've, n- I've never watched it. Should, is it something I should watch? Yeah, it, it's a good movie. So the book's better. The so Dennis Lehane wrote the book Live by Night. So uh, I kind of met Dennis previously. He graduated the same college I did, and he lived here in in St. Pete for a little while. When he was doing a research for Live by Night, um, I gave him a private tour of Ebor, the mob tour. Um, and I got a nice shout out in the book, which is cool. And um, so, you know, he was really trying hard to make it, you know, it's fictional, but as accurate as possible. And and for a movie, yeah, the movie is good. It, it kind of really. It's gotten, forgot, it's gotten forgotten about. I mean, nobody talks about that movie. Yeah, it's on Netflix now. But um, it was a big budget and they've got some good actors in it. And for whatever reason, I've never pulled the trigger on watching it. Yeah, it's good. It's I would say maybe a little long. But um, I, I thought it was good. The only the big bone I have to pick with it, and it has nothing to do with the filmmakers because they were kind of handcuffed, is that it wasn't filmed in Tampa. It wasn't filmed in Ebor. It was filmed in Georgia because of the tax incentives that they have for making movies in Georgia. So yeah. it really it loses some of that authenticity because Ebor is wholly unique in, in its architecture and how it's set up. Um, so I, I think... That that kind of, and, and certainly for people in Tampa <laughs> that have seen it, they're like, uh, it's not Ebor City. <laughs> D- don't get so. Scott talking about the White Boy Rick movie. Oh, and where they, they, they shot it. They, they shoot it in Cleveland, and in, in, in uh, at the house that the White Boy Rick and his family are supposed to be living in. There's like a there's like a creek. There's like a a brook, <laughs> like running through. I'm like, I've never seen that in the on the east side of Detroit before. 
<laughs> there ain't no there ain't no uh babbling brook of water yeah. uh you know some some place where you can go uh uh collect your thoughts and and live in uh you know tranquil uh peace it's like it's a it's a freaking third world country where where rick mm-hmm. uh grew up he, there was no uh, body of water that you could go uh, canoeing on uh behind his house and then conversely kill the irishman for guys like us i mean i, I think that movie's entertaining but you could tell that it was filmed in Detroit. It was all filmed in Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty obvious to Detroit. Not Cleveland. Not like Cleveland. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's so funny. when I'm watching it, it's supposed to be Cleveland. I'm like, wait a minute. That that's clearly Detroit. So I, I feel <laughs> you, Scott. I, I can I can see how that would, you know, disrupt your enjoyment yeah. of, the, yeah. of the film. Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. We've been trying we've been trying to book Scott for like a year and we kept yeah. on getting our uh you know schedules uh could never align and uh Great interview, great book. Go out and get it. Um, you know, M- Mikey Mancuso, <laughs> he'll be a through line, I think, through a lot of our content uh, over the next couple of years because of his prominence in the New York underworld right now. This was, you know, um, a snapshot of, of Mikey Mancuso at an earlier age and then whatever possible role he played uh in, in the downfall of mikey meldish so I, that was um something that i was really eager to discuss and i thought we mm-hmm. did a good job of calling that up and and scott you know nothing but respect on our end thank you for joining thanks. us yeah absolutely love love the show and uh thanks for having me on guys appreciate it so so please like subscribe share um original gangsters content we like giving it to you we're going to keep bringing you the, you know the best true crime content you can find online For Scott Dietschy, our guest, for Ben Behind the Glass, and for Jimmy the Doctor, uh, I am Scott Bernstein. We'll see you next week on the full-length OG pod. Out.